to um, listen to this webinar. So as Joe said, I'm Jason Pinchar from the Fox River Valley Public Library District. Um, I'm the digital services manager here. And basically what that means is I teach most of the technology classes we offer. We offer about 12 technology courses a month. Um, and I do most of our one-on-one -on -one training as well. So we offer about, this past, past month we did about 22 one-on-one -on -one sessions. And then on top of that, I take care of most of the IT stuff for the library. So troubleshooting the desktops, uh, the Macs, and all of that stuff. So, But I wanted to put out there before we go on that, you know, I've been working in libraries for probably the past uh, 13 years. And in all of that time, I really haven't done any formal technology training. So, you know, I got my library degree and kind of just fell into the role of teaching technology classes, which kind of led me to doing some more of this IT stuff. So with that said, you know, I just want to put out there that you know, learning technology, learning new technology skills doesn't, you know, require any sort of specific education. Um, I don't come from a technology background, but um, I certainly use it every day and I help people use it. So I think it's something that's important and certainly something that um, we can all learn from. So the topic for today is 10 easy steps to improve your technology skills. Now I'm sure because you're all here, you all feel that you can learn a thing or two about technology. I mean, we all know that libraries are more and more becoming spaces where technology is flourishing. We may work in libraries where we have maker spaces or 3D printers. We probably all work in libraries where if, if we work the reference desk, we've had people come up who need help using Microsoft Word to create a resume or using an iPad or an iPhone or something like that. So really what I want to focus on with these um, 10 easy steps is, is getting to a point where we're comfortable asking those questions that take place on the reference desk and we're also comfortable talking about new technologies and emerging technologies. Because the truth is really, however, that being tech savvy is not so much about knowing how to use all technology proficiently because really nobody out there knows how to do that, but knowing you know what's out there, what's on the horizon, what's coming up. Because if you can talk about things that are current in, in the technology world, then that's the first step to really uh, knowing of what's out there and, and being on the, the front lines of technology and, and being ahead of the game, really. So with these 10 easy steps that you can use in your everyday life, you're going to have what you need to basically stay current with technology. Um, and I want to point out, I'll be referencing some resources here. Um, when this is made available online, I have all the resources listed um, at the end of, of the slides here. So feel free to write them down as we go along or look at it later, you know, whatever you prefer. They'll be available to you. All right. And I like to call this a checklist for success. And we're going to cover all 10 of these steps today. The first being use your library. And I'll expand on, on all of these in the coming slides, but using your library, whether it's the library you work at or your home library, all libraries have something to offer. Most libraries have different services to offer, and I'm sure we all know that they're great places to learn things. Use people in your organization. So again, we all work in organizations, and we probably all work in organizations where uh, we have different people who have different skill sets. And we also have different resources. So there's a lot of these things that we can use within our organization. Um, shadow everyone. I'm a firm believer, and I'll go over this more later, of shadowing people in an effort to learn different technology skills. I think it's a great way to learn new skills. And it's fairly simple. Dive in. And what I mean by dive in is asking for a project that requires a new skill. I know, you know, for me, oftentimes it's hard to learn something new unless you absolutely have to. You know, if a supervisor says, make me a chart in Excel, that's when you have to do it. It's not when you're just sitting at home thinking to yourself, hey, maybe I want to learn that. So if you ask for a project that requires a new skill, that's going to put you on, on pace with learning that. And then read blogs and listen to podcasts. So again, I'll talk about some of these later. Social media is a great resource that you can use to not only find about 
technology news and, and current things with technology, but also um, connecting with people and learning how to use social media outlets themselves. Use social learning tools, so it's another way that we can learn. Search for it. Take tech time. And then finally, embrace I don't know. And I actually have an 11th step, uh, which we'll cover at the end as well. So to begin, the best thing that, that any of us can do really is to use our libraries. So again, our libraries are different. We vary in size, we vary in budgets, we vary in the resources that we have available to our patrons and to staff. So, you know, whether it's the library that you work at or the library you belong to, whatever your home library is, it's great to use these resources. So, some of you may have Gale Courses available at your libraries. Um, if you don't, Gale Courses is an online resource that offers six-week online courses in computer technology, computer and professional development, personal development, and writing and publishing. So, they have tons of different courses that you can take that are self-paced to learn different skills. Uh, this is a resource, you know, for me, we actually don't have available at my library, but um, I know that my parents' library has it available, so, you know, they were nice enough to give me their library card so I could use that resource as well. And of course, these are just a few of those resources. Again, we might have more than, you know, that, that's out there. It's, it's hard to get them all in here, but then, of course, there's lynda.com, which is probably the best resource, in my opinion, that's available to public libraries today to learn new technology skills. So Lynda is an online resource. Again, it has over 4,000 video tutorials ranging from uh, 3D design to Excel to photography. Something that I was super excited about when I got access to Lynda is their 7-hour um, Windows 10 course. I'm really looking forward to taking that one because I've, I've dabbled with Windows 10, but I by no means use it on a regular basis. So I'm really looking forward to that course. And they have, again, courses on anything, web design, photography, little quick courses. So if your library has that resource, you know, really it's, it's probably one of the best ones to use and one that I point people to um, all the time. Then there's Treehouse, which is a bit more advanced, but a lot of libraries that are diving more into the maker spaces and the idea of making um, are using Treehouse because it's an online resource that offers tutorials on coding. Um, it's a great thing that many libraries are using um, as, as self-guided resource but also a class-guided resource. So, you know, they'll have classes using Treehouse um, to teach coding to kids or, or even adults. And then probably one of the most popular ones, or something that has been the most popular, is Learning Express Library, uh, which is an online resource that offers tutorials from job skills to technology. And Learning Express Library, in my mind, is probably of these the most beginner um, type of resource that we can use. So they have tutorials on you know, Intro to Word or Advanced Word, and they start basically from square one and go every, through everything uh, very easily and, and it's really easy to follow. You know, I know personally I've used Learning Express Library to create course materials for our classes because of the way that they um, present their information. Um, and I've learned things from Learning Express Library. So again, you know, when I started teaching technology classes, I didn't necessarily know everything about Word or Excel. And I still don't know everything about Excel. So when I was sitting down to think about what you know, an intermediate Excel course would encompass, I looked to Learning Express Library and went through their intermediate course to get ideas of, of what I could do. And it, in the process of that, I learned things about Excel that I didn't know before because I didn't necessarily ever have to use that stuff. But uh, it's certainly stuff that, that's important. And then, of course, there's the ability, if you have somebody in your library that does teach technology classes, uh, this is me teaching a class at our library, you know, go ahead and, and take a technology class with them. Recently here um, at, at Fox River Valley Library, we instituted a core competency checklist for staff 
So staff have to go through this checklist every year and basically uh, make goals and, and meet some of these competencies. So we've had numerous staff members take our technology classes and also set up one-on-one -on -one times with me. And it's something that I feel is important to our profession. I feel it's important um, for, for my job to help staff learn these different skills. So you know, we've actually set uh, spaces aside in classes for staff uh, to be able to take those classes. So if you have classes at, at your libraries, you know, nobody's going to make fun of you uh, for taking a technology class because we work in libraries and you know, they're learning environments, they're collaboration environments. Um, and these are all resources that, that we all can offer uh, to each other. You know, I've actually had um, some people, uh, technology trainers, who have come out and uh, sat in on some of my classes to get ideas of, of what to do um, at their libraries. So you know, we all use each other. Um, it's not just people who may not know something about uh, a certain resource. And then there are of course, free resources aside from what you can use in your library. One being gcflearnfree.org. So if you haven't used gcflearnfree.org, I highly suggest that you go um, and check that one out. So it's run by the Goodwill Community Foundation. And they have basic tutorials ranging anywhere from resume building to Windows to Microsoft Office. And if I'm trying to help you know, a patron myself, usually the first place that I point them to is, is GCF Learn Free because the tutorials are very hands-on and they're also very, very basic. So it's a really nice starting point to go from. Um, you know, to, to further that, I've used GCF Learn Free myself um, for our typing class that we, we just offered for the first time because GCF Learn Free has, in my opinion, one of the best online typing tutorials for free. So I adapted some of the things they use there for a hands-on class that we had in the library. Um, then we have uh, the University of North Carolina's Community Workshop Series. And this is not so much a resource to learn technology as it is um, a place where they have really, really awesome handouts for the technology courses that they've offered in their community. So I've, again, taken some of their information and adapted it for our library. I've used their handouts in my classes. I just took them straight from there, printed them out, and used them. Uh, but you can also go through those and, and learn a thing or two as well. They have great courses on uh, Excel, Word, and, and PowerPoint. Then there's digitalliteracy.gov. So digitalliteracy.gov offers a compilation of resources to help boost your skills. This one is, you know, in my mind, more geared towards um, very, very, very beginner learners. But there are tons of different resources that they've brought together and, and made available on that website. And if you haven't already used Web Junction, Web Junction is also a really great resource because they have a bunch of free webinars on there that you can view. They have a big archive, much like Rails does, um, and you know anything library related they have on, on their website. And then last, yeah, I encourage everybody who is trying to learn new technology skills or just stay, you know, to stay abreast of technology to get involved. And a really easy way to get involved is through digitallearn.org, which was launched a couple of years ago by PLA and IMLS. Um, and it gives you the ability to, to find learning resources directly from people in the library field. So it's a community of learners and contributors. When I first got on it, I got on there to look for a handout from you know anyone else in, in the world that had a handout for Windows 8 um, because I really didn't want to create one myself. And what I found was that there were other people on there who wanted information that I had. So it became a great resource to start trading information and, and kind of find out what other people are doing in libraries uh, related to technology. And of course, in libraries, we all know that there's not going to be any judging, right? We want to believe that this is true um, because we all use these resources. I mean, even the people who work with technology every day use different resources to learn new things. You know, like I said, I don't know everything about technology, I'm not even close. 
So when I have a question or I need to learn a new skill, I'll go on these, these resources and I do it openly and I encourage everybody else to do it because in a library environment we shouldn't be judging each other on wanting to or you know, the ability to learn a new skill. Because again, you know, regardless of what anybody says, no one knows everything. All right, so moving on to step number two. So this one's fairly straightforward, but use people in your organization. What I mean by this is if you can, look for a tech mentor at your library. So somebody who maybe does teach technology classes or who knows a lot about technology or who's very interested in technology and have that person be your mentor, you know, try to learn from that person um, because they have a breadth, a wealth of knowledge that they can pass along. Uh, you know, you might have a tech savvy intern that's there and you might pick their brain for knowledge. You know, I used to work uh, in a place where one of our staff members just loved technology in general. And the newest technology, he was always talking about it and every time we would work at the reference test together, he would always talk about what was new and what was happening and you know, sometimes it got to be a bit much but looking back on it, I realized that I learned a lot about what was on the forefront of technology um, from that person talking to me about you know, the newest Android phone or, or what have you. <clears throat> and number three, which is probably one of my favorite steps to take when you're trying to learn technology or learn a new technology or again stay afloat with what's new in technology is to shadow everybody. So observe your colleagues in action. Again, if there's somebody who's really good with technology, watch them. If, if they're giving a one-on-one -on -one at the reference desk or if somebody comes in with an iPad question, sit in on that and, and observe what they're saying and, and learn from that situation as well because it's, an, it's the easiest thing to do um, if you're just sitting around and, and somebody comes up and has a question just to listen in and, and see how somebody responds. Um, so you know you might want to listen for key words or words used most often in those cases as well because usually a lot of these key words factor into other things and you might you know, look up and see what those are because learning is a process and really you know, nobody should be ashamed uh, to want to learn. In, in my experience, you know, here I was recently promoted to the position of digital services manager, uh, which again includes managing basically all of the IT in the library, which is troubleshooting the computers, uh, making sure everything works, troubleshooting printers and so forth. And I really didn't have that skill set before I started in this role. I mean, I had taught technology classes, you know, I had the technology mindset, but I didn't know how to do a lot of that stuff with PCs. Um, and I really, really learned a lot uh, from the person who preceded me, who still is here. She trained me in, in all of this and just listening to what she had to say and, and observing what she did really uh, got me to a point where I felt comfortable doing everything on my own. But I also had the ability to reach out to other people um, in the profession as well. So, um, you know, I did reach out to old colleagues who are in the IT field. Um, I reached out through listservs and, and networking groups to um, other people who were IT managers at other libraries. And, you know, many of them invited me to come to their library to see how they did things. Um, and I learned a lot from that, just going to their libraries, talking to them to see how their department was structured how they manage the technology in their library. I mean, everybody, again, is, is openly willing to help. And uh, if you can break down that barrier of, of feeling, uh, you know, a little scared to ask for help, it, it really helps. Um, another example here is we were, the first, one of the first things I did here was get Max to deploy out to the library. And, you know, I'd never done that before on, on the scale of making them available for patrons. But, you know, I knew, obviously, that other libraries were doing it. So I contacted the libraries that did and, you know, again, went out and saw exactly how they set them up and was able to come back and, and do it myself. So to me, that proved you know, most beneficial in, in this, this entire process. All right. And then there is dive in. And what I mean by dive in is, you know, really hold yourself accountable for 
learning different technologies. So ask for a project that requires a new skill. Take on tasks that force you to learn something new even if you don't know how to do it. And this can be as simple as you know creating a chart in Excel. If you want to present your data in a different way, you know, think of a way that you've never done before and, and figure out how to do that. So create a chart with Excel, present it to your boss and, you know, hey, your, your data looks better than it, than it did before. Um, or, you know, it can be certainly involved. So when I was um, in a different organization, uh, the team librarian and myself decided to create a blog for the library. Um, and we weren't exactly sure at that time how we were going to do it. We just knew that we wanted to do it. So we you know, were talking to different staff to get people involved and came to the point where we had to create this thing and, and make it look good and make it look like it belonged to our library. And in this instance, um, you know, we decided to go with WordPress, a free WordPress site. And when we began, you know, I was looking through the different templates that they have in WordPress and really realized that none of the templates were going to fit what we wanted to do. They all needed to be edited in some fashion. And I had no idea at that time how to edit it unless I bought you know, the, the paid version of it where you can easily change colors and things. So what that did was it really forced me to learn how to go behind the scenes and to change that HTML code that uh, was, was behind that template in an effort to change those colors, to change the text, and so on and so forth. And I was lucky enough to have the time to do it because my boss really believed in the project. Um, and I spent countless hours trying to learn basic HTML to change certain things. And I remember the day that, that I realized and learned how to change the color um, of one of our menus through the HTML code. And it was kind of this epiphany moment. Uh, and I remember my boss's door was open and I you know, yelled out, oh, I figured out how to do it. And it, it just clicked. Um, and that was really all it took. And, and once that clicked, it wasn't as hard as it seemed to be before. But it took the time and it took the curiosity um, and it took the interest in order to do it. And with that, you know, that, that also goes along with the, the notion of use it or lose it. So you know, even if you ask for, it, for a task that requires a new skill and you, you learn a new skill, so often do we forget those things. Uh, when I'm thinking back on that blog, you know, I was two years ago now, I haven't really done much with HTML since then, and I find now when I try to do things, you know, I've forgotten a lot that, that I learned back then. So find a way that, that you're going to use it and incorporate it into your everyday uh, workflow, and, and it will certainly stick with you. And of course, you know, with, with all of this, it gives you more ways to impress your boss, your supervisor, your director, whomever that might be because you're learning a new technology skill and you're learning something that maybe other people in your organization don't know about and you can always give that knowledge back. And then probably my next favorite thing to do and, and one of the easiest things to do really to learn anything about technology is to read blogs and listen to podcasts. So. Blogs are a great way to get quick information, and you don't have to be an expert to read them. Generally, people who write blogs are writing them in a way that anybody can understand because in an effort really to reach the largest possible audience, you have to write in a way that other people are going to understand and read. And they're, they're an easy thing to do to incorporate into your daily workflow. So for me, I've always tried to have a list of blogs that I know are relevant and useful, that I like to read, or you can just look at the headlines. And that's the first thing I'll do in the morning when I get to work. You know, I'll sit down at my desk, I'll go, I'll look at all of the blogs right in the morning and see what the headlines are. And if there's something that interests me, I'll read, breeze through it. And I've incorporated that into my workflow. So I just do it every day. It's something I don't really think about anymore. Um, and you know, with that, it's it's not necessarily always about re reading the full text of an article. You know, some blog posts are boring, some are exciting, but a lot of the times the the headlines can tell you everything. So, you know, when Windows 10 came out, I was looking at a lot of these technology blogs and sites and things, and most of the headlines are Windows 10, you know, great, but has bugs, and that told me all I needed to know. You know, if I was thinking about deploying it out to the public computers here. Well, it still has bugs, so maybe I'll wait on that. 
I didn't have to read any of those articles. I got that information right away, and then I could go talk to somebody else and say, oh, yeah, you know, I heard Windows 10 had, had uh, some bugs in it. Um, and you just gain that, that really basic knowledge. Um, and as far as podcasts are concerned, again, I'll give some examples of, of this stuff in a second. Um, if you have a commute, podcasts are a really great way to take up that time in the commute. Unfortunately, and fortunately, I don't have very long of a commute, so it's harder for me to listen to podcasts because I don't like listening to half of it and then getting to work and, and having to listen to the other half later. Because usually I forget about it, but they're really easy because you just put it on in the background, you listen to people talk, and, and you know you just go with it. Um, so you know, again, just make that part of your ritual, and and once it's it's part of your daily workflow, you're not really going to think about it anymore. <clears throat> and with that, it's also a great use of desk time. So if you do work on the reference desk and you have a slow period, open a blog and just breeze through it. It's a great way to spend your time at a desk. And if anybody asks, it's library related. I mean, some of these blogs are, you know, specifically for libraries. Some of them aren't. But you know, technology nowadays is so relative to libraries that it would be hard to say that learning something about Technology is not related to the library. So some of the ones that I find to be uh, the best and most interesting to me, and you might have ones that, that you read that are different, and I encourage you to share those. Um, the first is Stevens Lighthouse, um, and that's Stephen. If you want to write this down, that's StevensLighthouse.com, and this is a blog that is written by Stephen Abram, who is a librarian and executive director of the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries. And his blog is probably the most extensive library blog I've ever found. Um, he blogs on topics like technology, library news. Oftentimes he'll put up infographs, things about just designing, making PowerPoint presentations or presentations in general, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. You know, I don't understand how he can be a director of a library and also scan the internet for all of these different resources and, and blog about them all the time. But really, you could just use this one as, as your go-to blog and you'll find so much out about libraries and technology that you really won't have to read any other blogs. Um, his is, is, again, probably the most extensive one. Getting more into the technological realm of libraries. Uh, the Digital Shift is, is another good one from Library Journal. Uh, this one focuses more on ebooks and, you know, as it says, really the shift from, from print to the digital. But it also talks a lot about library technology, so really technology that is specific to libraries. They cover a lot of stuff on maker spaces. Um, they cover a lot of stuff on social media. So how to use social media, when's the best time to post on social media and so forth. Another one I recently found out about and, and didn't know about before is uh, the TechSoup for Libraries blog. And if you don't know what TechSoup is, TechSoup is basically um, a company that offers um, discounted rates to educational institutions. They have it specifically for libraries as well um, on technology. So I only found out about TechSoup when I you know, was put in charge of ordering and, and purchasing new technology. but they have a blog in, in which they offer, again, much like some of these other ones, tips for social media, library news. They'll talk about new products that they have to offer the library community, which if you follow it, it's a great way to put in the word to your IT people to say, hey, maybe this is something that we need for our library. Um, and they, they'll talk a little bit about design, and then, of course, there's some other things that are on there. Um, and that is techsoupforlibraries.org backslash blog and then if you didn't catch the digital shift one that is the digital shift.com and then the last blog I'll mention here we're not blog per se but a website is the verge and the verge is basically all things technology it's not related to libraries really in any direct way um, I found out about this one because that same coworker I had uh, a little little bit ago uh, would 
basically be on this website anytime he had free time on the reference desk. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, well, how is this even relevant to working in a library? You know, is he just wasting his time looking at all these things he's interested in? And then I realized now when I'm in charge of, of purchasing technology for a library that this was actually a pretty useful website to stay current. Um, and again, if, if all you want to do is stay current and just figure out what's on the horizon, The Verge is a really great place to go. So they have a lot of reviews of new phones that are coming out, or new tablets, or you know, new computers. They had a whole bunch of stuff on Windows 10. Most recently, they had something about um, Apple TV, which caught my eye to the extent that I decided to go and buy one. Um, but it's a really great, great source for for finding information about technology and things that are just coming out. And then, as far as podcasts are concerned. The ones that I really pay attention to is there's the Verge cast, which is the same thing as the Verge here, and they have you know, some folks that they get together and, and do a podcast and talk about new technologies that are coming out and reviews and jibber jabber back and forth. Usually they're drinking when they're doing the, the podcast, so it makes it a little bit more humorous um, at times. So that one I would really recommend if all you want to do is just you know kind of figure out what's out there. Um, but the, the other one that I really like, too, is the NPR TED Radio Hour. So NPR hosts um, a podcast where they basically will take TED Talks um, and combine them into a podcast. So they'll talk about things you know, anywhere from technology-related to you know, the brain and, and all sorts of stuff. But you know, every, every now and again, they'll do something about technology. Um, I remember... On the way to work one day, I was listening to one, and they had um, the guy on there that invented the CAPTCHA. So if you if you know the CAPTCHA, that that Petsky box you have to type in um, the letters and numbers or whatever is there to prove that you're not a robot. You've probably all seen these. And you know, I'm listening to this, and it was interesting because I'm thinking, well, yeah, why would why would he create this? This is terrible. Nobody likes these things. And what he was saying was that. Basically, what they're doing with those is they're taking the text that people are typing in and they're using it to digitize books. So they're basically enabling people who don't even know uh, the ability to, to digitize books that aren't already digitized. And I thought that was interesting because it put a little bit more perspective on the matter than I had before. Uh, because before, you know, I thought they were just a pain in the butt. So they have a whole bunch of different ones on, on the TED Radio Hour, and if you just go back through the archives, you'll find surely find topics that, that interest you. And again, I encourage you all to share podcasts or blogs that, that you find interesting because it's hard really to find them all. So moving on, the sixth thing that you can do is to use social media. And I really mean this in two separate ways. So you know, while social media in itself doesn't necessarily seem like something that's going to increase your technology skills, there are a lot of elements to using social media that come into play in other realms of using technology. You know, uploading a picture or using a hashtag, you know, all these things you use when you use social media. And I say that because this is important because a lot of the patrons that are coming to our libraries are needing help with social media. I mean, we have, you know, how often have we seen a you know, grandma coming in who's trying to become friends with her, her grandson on Facebook to see what her grandson's doing, or become friends with her son on Facebook to see what, what her grandkids are doing. You know, that's probably one of the most common things that, that I've heard here uh, when, I, when I have um, an older adult come in. So knowing how to use those resources are going to help you help them, which, again, is certainly a good thing. And then, of course, another one that's that's big now is a LinkedIn profile. So if you don't have a LinkedIn profile or you really don't see a need for a LinkedIn profile, I would say you know, the need to set up a LinkedIn profile is there so that you can then show somebody else how to use LinkedIn. Because that's another thing in the, some of our communities, is people coming in trying to set up LinkedIn profiles because they've haven't had a job for the past few years or they just got laid off and they haven't had to find a job in 25 years and they want to know how to use LinkedIn, they want to know how to create something that looks professional that's going to put them out there. 
and if we have something to, to go off of to show them, then that's going to help that person. Uh, when I teach a LinkedIn class, and even a Facebook class for that matter, I show my personal LinkedIn page, I show my personal Facebook page, and in all of those instances, you know, especially with Facebook, I preface it with, you know, I haven't been on Facebook for the past hour, so I have no idea what's going to pop up when I log in, but that's a learning point if something pops up that's, you know, not, not safe for work. Um, because people want to see it and they want to know how to use it, and if we can show them what we've been doing, that certainly helps in that learning process. But going off of that, the second part of, of the social media thing here is there are also really great resources to help you stay current with technology trends. So Twitter, I don't use Twitter very often. I don't necessarily like tweeting. Um, sometimes I'll tweet if I'm at a conference or something and everybody else is doing it, but I can't say I tweet very often. But Twitter is one of the greatest resources that you can use to learn things about technology or just to stay current with technology. So this doesn't mean you have to be active on Twitter. All it means is that you just have to follow certain people or companies or organizations on Twitter and then whatever they post is just going to pop up in your Twitter feed and you get that instant access. So I'll list off some here and again these are going to be part of the presentation. Um, at the end as a slide, so uh, if that becomes made available online, you will see those, but the first one I'll mention here is TechCrunch. So that's tech and then crunch, um, and what, and that's a, a Twitter feed, and what TechCrunch is, um, they talk about all things technology basically with breaking technology news, opinions, and analysis. So really talks about all, all things related to to technology and new technologies that are coming out. And then moving on from there, there's Wired. Um, if you haven't heard of Wired, it's Wired Magazine. It's been around for quite some time. It blends technology and lifestyle, so they'll often post things on Twitter that are related to you know, technology and the lifestyle of technology. So we all know people who are really embedded in technology and who love getting, you know, an Apple smartwatch or, or whatever. Um, but they talk a lot about that. Um, the next one is Makershed. And Makershed is an online reseller of, uh, or not reseller, I should say, but online uh, business that sells products related to makerspaces. So Make, you make these, all of these things we might see floating around our libraries and in our children's areas and so forth. Uh, but they also, on their Twitter feed, they talk a lot about maker projects. So if you're interested yourself about learning more of maker projects that you can incorporate into your library, if you just follow this Twitter feed, you're going to get a lot of that information uh, from the feed. So again, even with just those headlines that pop up, you're going to find something right in that headline that you might be able to apply directly to your library. So the next one that we have here is Make, and Make is the Twitter feed for Make Magazine, which is another uh, maker-oriented magazine, and their Twitter feed is more about um, DIY projects, so they're more on talking about how-to things rather than selling things. So DIY projects, they'll post things about that. They'll post how-to tutorials, um, relate things to tech news, electronics. They talk about crafts and ideas. So again, if you're trying to get into this maker realm that's been floating around, uh, Make is a great one because there's these really, really cool projects that they post that you can you know, a lot of the times do in your library at little to no cost. Uh, Another one that I follow is Thingiverse, which is um, a free resource where people post their 3D objects to download for 3D printing. So uh, if your library is, is into 3D printing, Thingiverse is a good Twitter feed to follow because it's really all about 3D printing. So they talk more um, about what's happening in the 3D printing world, but also you know designs that people have submitted and so forth. Uh, the next one is another maker one, which is make it at your library. So that's make it and then the at symbol, your library. And this is all about connecting librarians to makerspace projects. 
So again, projects that you can do within your library that are part of the maker culture, the maker movement. CNET is another one which is really big on just talking about technology itself. So it's technology product reviews, technology news. They give price comparisons for different uh, technology things, um, videos, and, and podcasts. So CNET is a whole big thing, a whole website in and of itself. And in their Twitter feed, they will post a lot of that stuff. Uh, Mashable is another one. And here they have news, resources, um, inspiration, and fun for the connected generation. So, you know, really what they need, what they mean by the connected generation are, you know, those people who grew up with technology. Uh, so, if you're not part of that generation, maybe it won't apply so much to you. But I'm sure if if you work in a library, you see a lot of that generation there as well. So that's a good one to get news. And then the last one uh, again is Stephen Abram. So. Stephen Abram is uh, from Stephen Lighthouse, the blog, and what he does on his Twitter feed is he basically tweets the headline for whatever he's blogging about. So if you don't even want to read what he's blogging about, just follow him on Twitter and you'll see the headlines, and if something interests you, all you got to do is click on it, um, and then it's going to take you over to his blog or somewhere else where you can read that full article. So really, you know, if you don't do anything else, or learn anything else from this webinar, the number one takeaway I would say um, is to use Twitter to get the information you want or need or what have you about technology because there's so much on it and you can you know, make it however you want. You can follow whoever you want or not follow whoever you want. You can interact with Twitter. You don't have to interact with Twitter. Uh, it can be a bystander thing. But I would really push that as, as something to implement and again into just your daily workflow. When you have those downtimes, open up Twitter app and you know, see see what pops up. So moving on to number seven, we have <clears throat> use social learning tools. Um, and I'll get into social learning tools here and what they are in a second. But generally social learning tools are free. They allow you to learn at your own pace, and they allow you to learn when it's convenient for you. So really, any time that you have access to the internet, you can use a social learning tool. But you have to be self-motivated, which is really the key here, um, is that self-motivation. I can't tell you how many times I start learning something, um, and then I never finish it because I just can't find the time, or I just really don't care about it anymore. And perhaps the, the biggest example of the social learning tool is a MOOC. So if you haven't heard of a MOOC before, they've been around for a while now. Um, that's a massive open online course. And here are just three of the biggest providers of MOOCs out there. So there's edX, Coursera, and Udacity. They're free. Generally, again, they're free. They allow you to learn at your own pace when it's convenient. There's 1,200 plus courses available across all of these different platforms. These courses generally range 8 to 10 weeks. And the big thing here is that only about 7% of the people who start a MOOC actually finish one. Um, and I've been hearing some buzz around you know, the library world about libraries that are actually using MOOCs in the physical library. So they're gathering people together who all want to take the same class in the library so it kind of forces you to sit down and, and do it and not give up. Uh, personally, I, I explored a MOOC once and it was um, a course on, on Ernest Hemingway and I think it was offered being offered by Harvard and basically it was videotaping of, of all these lectures and then you were provided the assignments and the readings and I think I started it and, and that was it. Um, I went, did one, one little session and I never went back to it because you know, I didn't have that self-motivation. But they are good and they have a lot of great content and a lot of content from you know, renowned universities on there as well. And then we have some that you probably have heard more about or, or used more. Um, YouTube, you know, it is a social learning tool. I mean, it, it is a space where people do post videos that are senseless or 
you know, have other value, but there are videos on YouTube for how to do things. And if you want to figure out how to do anything, you know, YouTube is a really great resource to figure that out. If you want to learn how to fix the problem with your car, chances are there's somebody on YouTube who's posted the video about it. I learned this when, when we first got a 3D printer at our library. Um, I had no idea how to use the printer. I had no idea how to design any objects in 3D. I'd never used one. I'd never seen one. Uh, but we got one, and I was in charge of doing something with it. And YouTube was where I found all of the best tutorials to learn how to design objects using SketchUp. It was really a great place, and you can read the comments, and sometimes the comments are laughable, but oftentimes people will post meaningful things in the comments, like links to other videos, or you know, they'll talk about how maybe that specific video is, is not helpful. So in that way, it really is a social learning tool because there's that collaboration going on there. The second one here is, is TED. So we talked a little bit about, about TED before, but I'm sure you've all seen TED Talks. You know, they're, they're pretty big. We've, they've been around for a while. Um, and TED tends to focus on technology, entertainment, and design, uh, but it gets into science and, and whatever else you can think of. But TED Talks are a great way to, to learn new things about technology. You know, I referenced the one about the CAPTCHA, but they have a whole bunch of other ones that go far more in depth uh, with, with technology. And then the last one here, and this one, you know, may hit home for some of you and may not, but it's Microsoft Virtual Academy. And what Microsoft Virtual Academy is, it's an online tool, it's free, uh, and there's a whole bunch of self-paced courses, again, from Microsoft, generally using Microsoft uh, softwares. So, and, and these are more, you know, hard IT based. So they have, you know, a beginner getting to know Windows course, but a lot of it is you know, learning networking or learning to set up a server or how to use a server or things that you can do on a server. For me, again, in my position, this was a big thing that I used to learn those things that I didn't necessarily know. Um, and these courses are all in preparation for exams that you can take to get different certifications. Um, so the, again, they're a little bit more in-depth and don't necessarily relate to everyday technology skills that you might use, but if you are interested in, in gaining more of that knowledge, uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy is great. The only drawback is that their, their lessons are extremely long and they're really hard to, to get through unless you have a lot of time. <clears throat> and then number eight here is really just search for it. So, you know, we all work in libraries. I'm sure we've all searched for things in various different ways, but searching for something online really oftentimes can yield the best results. If you have a question, you know, how to do something in Excel, if you just do a search for that specific thing online, you know, how to create a pivot table, you're going to get something that's bound to help you, whether it's directly from Microsoft or just somebody else that posted a video, you're going to find something. Um, there really isn't much that you can't figure out from, from searching online. I still, you know, again, I still teach a large amount of technology classes here at the library, and there's always questions that I can't answer. And I always go to Google to find out the answer to that question, or I'll start with Google to figure out the answer to that question. Uh, I had, interestingly enough, I had a lady come in uh, just yesterday who was really determined to delete her chat history from Skype on her Android device. And apparently this is something that's really hard to do, and she had been to the Verizon store, and she had been to Best Buy, and nobody could help her, and she remembered reading in the newsletter that we had people here who could help. So she came to me, and she was <clears throat> really in cahoots. Um, over over what to do, and you know I said straight straight out to her that I've never deleted Skype history on an Android phone, but I'm sure we can figure out how to do it. And so we sat down and I started poking around on her phone, and it really was not as simple as it as it should have been, which is why she was having the issue in the first place. There was no clear way to delete the the, the chat history on uh, her phone. So we sat together on the computer and, and Googled it and found a set of instructions 
on a Skype forum because this was a really hot topic um, of people talking exactly how to do it. And we went through that together, which was great because, you know, not only did I learn how to do it, if it will ever apply to me again, but she learned how to do it and she also learned herself how to just go online and, and be able to search for something. So if this happens again to her, she might, you know, maybe she'll search for it on, on the internet first and see if she can find something um, instead of, you know, obviously we were happy she came to us, but, you know, instead of going to Best Buy or, or Verizon first. So really there's, there's nothing that you can't find um, on that online environment. <clears throat> and then number nine here, kind of encompasses everything that we've just been talking about. And that's taking time out for tech. So setting some block of time every week, every day, every month, whatever, to do something with technology that you haven't done before. To learn a new technology skill or use a, a different technology that you haven't used. Um, just taking that time to do it and making it part of your routine is really going to help you. Uh, and you know, I try to do this in, in my daily life, but sometimes it doesn't all work out that well. But really, a great way to, to do this is to digitize your workflow. So what I mean by digitizing your workflow is take all those post-it notes that you have sitting around your desk and find an app or a program that's going to help you digitize those and organize those better than just sitting around your desk or all of your different notes and some examples I have here are uh, the one that I use the most, really myself, that I think anybody can can incorporate into their daily life um, is Wonderlist. So that's the, the picture of the app there. And what Wonderlist is, and that's W-U-N-D-E-R list, is it's just a, a simple program that, that gives you the ability to create lists. So you can have a list for work, a list for groceries, a list for things to buy. Um, and it's it's available on uh, your smartphone, your tablet as an app. You can access it online. You can access it on a desktop application. So it's all cloud-based. And you can create lists. And the nice thing about this is you can just put something on a list and when you're done with it, you click a checkbox, it makes a ding, and then it goes off your list and it drops down to things that you've already done. So what I find to be the best thing about it is I can look back and see, oh man, you know, I've actually accomplished 590 things from my work list, even though I'll have 30 different things on my work list. But it's great because if you're if you're on the go and you get an idea, you know, I, I sometimes I'm driving to work and I think about something that I have to do, you know, jot it down in, in, in Wonderlist real quick and then I get to work and it's already there on, on my desktop application. I don't really have to think about it anymore. Um, until I check it off or, or decide to do it. But with this, you know, really, you can learn that new app. And then you can share that app with other people. And then there's something about technology that, that you know you've boosted your skills that much more. Another one is it's for notes. So if you take a lot of notes and, again, you're, you're really sick of having pieces of paper laying around or if you're like me and you just grab the nearest notebook that's around and you write something down and you have notes in various notebooks. Um, Evernote is a great application that's available again as an app um, for your desktop, laptop and also online that gives you the ability to organize notes into different notebooks. They also have now the functionality of you can even publish a, an ebook through it. Um, I don't use Evernote that much myself, but I know people who swear to it and take all their notes in there because all they need to do, again, is sit down anywhere and go online and open it up and all their information is there. The same with Wonderlist. You could be on any computer, go to wonderlist.com, log in, and then there you're going to have all those different notes and lists that you've made. And then another great thing to do um, if you haven't already, this one might be a little more, more popular, is to digitize your calendar. So if you have a paper calendar, I know some people still prefer to have paper calendars or desk calendars. There are so many different ways to digitize your calendar now that it, it's, 
it, it almost doesn't make sense to use the paper calendar. Um, this icon here, here is, is Google Calendar, so if you have a Gmail account or if your library uses Gmail as their email provider, you may already have access to Google Calendar. And Google Calendar is great because you can put in events, you can set times for events, you can invite people to events, um, and they can accept the invite or not accept the invite. And it's another great tool that once you learn it, you can easily show it to somebody else and that might change the entire way that, that they work by, by digitizing their calendar. Um, a counterpart to this is Office 365. So if your library uses Office 365 um, as an email provider, then you likely have access to the calendar there where you can do the same thing. So you can, you can put in events, you can invite people to them, you can cancel events, you can share calendars with, with one another. Um, we use Office 365 here and uh, myself and, and another staff member, we have a one-on-one -on -one calendar. Um, so when we schedule one-on-ones, we'll put them in that calendar and if, if she's in it one day and, I, and I'm not and somebody needs that time, I'll just put the one-on-one -on -one in there and I'll invite her to it and then she knows that that's now on, on her calendar for her to do. So it's a really great way for us to interact um, together without actually having to send emails back and forth um, with it. And of course there are tons of other different applications you can use to digitize your workflow. I just chose three that, that I probably use the most. And then number 10 here, which again isn't last because I do have a, an 11, is really embracing the idea that you may not know something or you don't know something. So like with my Skype example uh, from, from yesterday, you know, I, I flat out said to the person that I really didn't know how to do it. Um, if had I said, yeah, I can help you with that, you know, I know how to do it right away, then she may have been a little frustrated when, when I realized that I had no idea how to do it. Um, so don't be ashamed to admit that you don't know the answer to a tech problem or question. You know, the best thing you can do is figure it out together, figure it out with the patron, and then you both learn something. You both can learn something from, from one another. Um, I, I had a coworker who wrote an article um, for her blog after she read a book, and in, in her blog post, this is something that struck me and, and always stands out to me. Um, she wrote, and this is her blog post, um, are you afraid to answer I don't know to a question? I have to do this once in a while in my work at the library ask here desk. I usually have no problem with this response because I always follow it with, but I can find out. But sometimes I do have a problem admitting that I'm not as knowledgeable as the person talking to me. And that was the first part of her post, uh, you know, just admitting that, that she didn't know certain things. Um, and this was somebody who wasn't particularly tech savvy. Uh, but she goes on to, to talk about in her blog post a situation in which she was in a job interview and they had asked her a bunch of questions of things, you know, she knew how to use certain things, and she flat out said that she didn't know. Uh, and in the first phone interview, <clears throat> she thought, hey, you know, once she said, I don't know, it was all stopped free from there. Once she admitted that she didn't know something, um, she felt more comfortable. And then she had received another call for a second interview, and, and she did the same thing. When she didn't know the answer to something, she said she didn't know. And ultimately, she ended up getting an offer for the job, which she, which she refused. But it just goes to show, you know, there, and, and that's why it sticks out to me, is that embracing the fact that you don't know something doesn't, doesn't mean that, that something bad is going to come from that. You know, it's, being able to say, I don't know, is, is something that's really a strength um, and, and should be a strength for, for most people because we can't all know everything, but a lot of times it'll work to our benefit and it, it comes as a learning moment. <clears throat> and then number 11 here, last but not least really is um, this notion of, of failing. And failing is something I think that's being talked about a lot more nowadays than I remember it, but you know, increasing your technology skills is really all about failure. It's really going to be all about failure. Uh, there's a great quote from Samuel Beckett that uh, Pima Chodron, and I probably butchered her name, but she wrote a book called Fail, Fail Again, Fail Better. 
Um, and as, as the title she uses, quote from Samuel Beckett, um, and it really encompasses what, what she tries to talk about in her book. But to, to go off that, I mean, we all fail at technology all the time. Technology fails all the time. Uh, being able to keep up with technology, you know, and be on the forefront is, is very hard. And <clears throat> really, in order to learn something, we're going to have to fail at some point. You know, something doesn't work, you're going to try it again, hopefully. If that doesn't work, you're going to keep trying. Maybe eventually you're going to ask for help. Maybe you'll look somewhere online for, for that answer. Or maybe in, in the end you find that there's nothing that you can actually do about it and it's actually the, the technology that's at fault. And then maybe you give up and then hopefully you don't. But every time, every time you fail, you, know, you learn not to do that same thing again. So you're going to fail better the next time because you're putting more thought and more emphasis into it. An example I have here is really something that, that drove me nuts for a very long time. Um, we had a computer here uh, that apparently had been freezing. It was a patron computer that apparently had been freezing maybe once a week for the past couple of years. Um, and it would freeze on patrons when they were using it and they would get upset and staff would get upset. So when I started in, in my role as the digital services manager, I kind of fell into this and quite, well, pr pretty soon people were getting, you know, upset with me because the computer kept freezing. So I decided to try to figure out what was wrong with it because that was, you know, really what, what I was tasked to do, what my job was. Um, and of course, the first thing that I thought was, it's not my fault. It's not my fault, you know, it's the computer's fault. Don't blame me for it. It's, it's all the computer. Blame it on Dell, right? So I called Dell. You know, we had a, a warranty with them, and they came out and replaced the motherboard and the hard drive of the computer. So basically replaced the entire computer. And then a few days later, it froze again. And, of course, now I'm getting really frustrated and kind of starting to feel like, like I don't know what is actually happening, and I have no uh, answer for this. Um, so I tried a whole bunch of different methods from, you know, I first tried a different power cord. A few days later, it froze again. So I had to rule out that it was the power cord. Uh, you know, next I tried a different Ethernet cable, and it froze again. And, of course, now I'm getting a little bit more frustrated, and all the staff who have to deal with this and patrons are getting more frustrated. And then a few days later, you know, I tried a different... Uh, network port, so I plugged it into a different uh, cable port, and a few days later, it froze again. And it really went on like this for, I, <laughs> I think, back in, in horror, um, probably about a month. And so I got beyond and off the phone with Dell, and Dell's sitting here telling me that it's not their fault, and that they did what they could do, and that it's something on our end. And I, I, have, no, I have no idea what it is, and patrons are losing their work and staff are, are at their wit's end, and I personally am, am beginning to question why I decided really to, to do this in the first place, you know, start questioning, you know, am I just not good at, at what I'm doing, was I not cut out for, you know, this, but you know, ultimately I'm not going to let one computer uh, bring me down even though it caused me some grief, so I wasn't willing to accept that, that it was the computer's fault. Um, so then it came to me one day when I was at home probably thinking about this that the one thing we didn't try was change the power outlet that, was, that it was plugged into. Um, so I plugged it into a different outlet and it hasn't frozen since then. You know, it took me all of those different, those different times of failing to, to figure out what it was. And if this ever happens again, I know now that the first thing I'm going to do is, is plug it into an outlet. But I also know the other steps that I took that, that could have been the problem. So I learned from all of those experiences and you know, I failed, I failed again and then ultimately I failed better. So these are, are moments really that we can use and transform into curiosity. So we have a problem, we try to figure out what it is and you know, we, we become determined to figure out what it is. We become curious learners and in the end hopefully Everybody wins. You know, we learn something new. Our organization benefits from from what we know. And you know, to end here, as a, as a last example, um, a more personal one, I should say. 
about failing um, and not being afraid to fail is that I started taking mandolin lessons some months ago now, and I was really excited about taking these lessons, and I thought, hey, I'm going to be the next Bluegrass star. You know, this is going to be great. And so I went out and bought a fancy mandolin and went to lessons, and it was the first lesson was great, and I was so excited. And I came home, and I was playing all the time, and I thought I sounded the best. But after about two months of, of lessons, I quit. I, I got to that point where I felt like I wasn't learning anything more, like I wasn't going to learn anything more. I couldn't do it. I didn't have it in me. I didn't have the creativity to, to go further with it. I just wasn't excited about going to lessons because the things I was learning, I just felt like I wasn't capable of. My, my brain couldn't comprehend all of that. So now I had this you know, $700 instrument that was basically collecting dust in my basement. And I could hear my fiance telling me this whole time, you know, over and over again, I told you not to buy that mandolin. You wasted your money on the mandolin. You're not going to, you know, you, you don't know if you're going to be good at it. You don't know if you're going to stick with it. So in my head, I'm, I'm listening to this voice. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know what? She was right. So, um, but the, the, the point of this story really is that I stopped playing and, and I felt really bad about it because I wasted all this money and, and my instructor called me and, and was trying to guilt me into taking lessons again and you know, I felt really bad. And then one day, I just out of nowhere, I think I was probably you know, sitting, in, sitting in my basement and looking for something to do and I grabbed the mandolin and, and just started playing it. And I, I just threw out everything that I learned. I just started playing notes and, and moving my fingers around and found that what I was playing was better than what I had learned and that what I had learned you know, at that point really didn't matter and after a couple more months of this which is what I've been doing you know a lot of the stuff that I learned is now making more sense to me so I, I ended up learning that in a different way and coming back to it in a different way and you know taking lessons maybe wasn't exactly how I was going to learn that specific thing so you know what I got from that is is, is in the end I, I failed better and with technology, I think that's a lot of, of what it encompasses. It's, it's you know, we, we might not learn something, so we try it again, or we try it a different way. We might not learn that time, so we try a different way. And we basically, you know, have to keep on, on trying and try different methods uh, to learn. And, and hopefully, um, what, what I've outlined here are, are 10 steps that you can take to help you learn something new about technology or to stay, you know, abreast on what's coming out. Um, in the tech world. So uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, open it up for, for questions if there are any. Um, I'd be happy to answer them. We have some time here. If not, my contact information was on that first slide. Uh, feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, my email address is j and then pinshower at frvpld.info. All right, so do we have any questions? All right. Well, thank you, Jason. And um, I certainly have some websites and blogs and podcasts that I can check out now. Um, so thank you for that. And while we give you a minute to catch your breath after talking for the last hour or so, um, I will remind everyone you can put questions in the, uh, the questions tab there on the control panel. And I see a couple that are coming in right now. I will also make mention of the fact that um, you know, we at Rails understand that technology is one of those um, continuing education training needs that is always going to be there. Uh, but, you know, for the 105 of you that are on this webinar, we also know that the word technology can mean a lot of different things depending on your library, your budget, where you are. So there, there's quite a spectrum. And, and along that spectrum are also the people um, in libraries that, um, have varying degrees of knowledge that can share information and that's why we have someone like Jason uh, with us today to be able to share this because often the networking you can do and the people you can connect with can really uh, help connect you to those new ideas and those things that you've always been wondering about. So the point is in the months ahead we're really hoping to do a lot more in the way of uh, continuing education around technology. And I think, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, we're having you back in February to talk about technology plans. Is that right? Um, yeah, I think it's how to um, get a technology proposal passed. That's right. Yes, that's correct. So 
that's just one of, of several that we have lined up in the months ahead. So, you know, subscribe to eNews, the Rails e newsletter if you haven't. That's a good way to find out about things that are um, that are upcoming. So we do have a little time left for questions, so I will just walk through a few that have come in. Um, starting with the first, Jason, what um, we've got someone that doesn't that's not familiar with makerspace. So can you try to define what a makerspace is for a library? Sure. So um, you know this 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 whole maker movement kind of I'll start here. Uh, the the maker movement kind of stemmed out of um, you know I think in in my opinion out of the you know great recession that we had where you know a lot of people took to doing things themselves. So you know you you would have taken your car into the mechanic to get it fixed, but with the great recession, a lot of people didn't have the money to do that. So a lot of people looked at these do-it-yourself methods of, of uh, fixing things and then it ultimately turned into creating things uh, which turned into this this concept of, of making things. So maker spaces in libraries encompass a lot of that. Many libraries that have maker spaces now have gone back to having sewing machines in that space so it's a dedicated space so people can come in and learn about sewing and, and sew things together or people can come in and use a 3D printer or use some software to create a 3D design to make something. Um, so there's, there's other technologies that are out there um, like snap circuits that might be in a maker space where kids can come in and use these uh, little circuits to connect them together to form a bond and, and ultimately learn about um, circuitry. So a maker space in, in a broad term is, is a place where people can come together in the space to make things. It, it's, it's almost like going using technology but also going back to the days where people actually made things themselves and, and didn't just buy things um, in the store. So um, we had a program recently on soldering. We did a basic soldering class for kids. Um, we don't have a maker space but that would be something that we would have done in a maker space. Okay. Um... Another question that came in, wondering if you have an opinion on um, atomic training as a learning resource. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I haven't really used atomic training very much. Um, you know, without, I guess, bashing any one resource, um, you know, Linda by far is, is the one that I would go to, but it's, it's a hard one to come by because it's very expensive for libraries. I mean, we don't have it. In, in our library because of, of the expense, but um, for what I gather from atomic training, it's very similar to Learning Express Library, um, but I really haven't used it uh, myself. Sure, um, and I will just add, you know, to to your point, Jason, about Linda. Um, you know, it is costly, uh, and actually at Rails. Um, we have, you know, they have a subscription model. One of one of the options is to kind of purchase a certain number of licenses that can kind of get used. Um, you, you kind of can cycle through a number of staff. You know, you can set up a system where it's, you know, you get two weeks with Linda, and then you move it on to another staff member that's interested. And, and so we started using that a few months ago, and, and we've been able to do it with not a whole lot of licenses, but just this, uh, this kind of rolling two-week period that people can use Linda to take a course and then when they're done we can um, transfer them over to another person on staff. And I'll just say that that has worked pretty well and it's not as expensive as trying to get a license for every person to be able to use it 24-7. You know, so there are some kind of other options but it is really in terms of kind of online on demand a great, great resource. Um, a, how, do, uh, how would you, what would you say, Jason, in terms of motivation, how to motivate employees to want to learn new technology? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, one way, one way is certainly, you know, we developed this, this core competency checklist, so um, in, in part, staff sort of have to do things um, to, to learn new, new technologies, but the best thing that, that I can do um, to motivate employees is to show an end product. So, you know, don't start with this is what you need to do and, you know, you need it, I need it two weeks from now. Start with 
showing somebody what that is. So let's say you know I want one of my staff members to um, learn how to design three-dimensional objects so that they can uh, teach a class on it. You know, I might show that person first the the object that I want them to design and talk about you know, how it's you know, so cool or or what what the what is actually being used for. Um, you know, as a another example of something that would be less exciting than that probably would be like an Excel chart. Um, you know, show the chart first and and talk about how you know whatever data is being used, why it it's better presented in that 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 way and how that actually um, you know, adheres to their job rather than just saying, hey, you know, we need you to do this, we need you to learn this, because if people find meaning in, in what they're doing and, and understand that it is going to be beneficial, um, that, that's a motivator in and of itself. Are you still there? Oh, sorry, Jason. Um, so another question here. Um, how do you find blogs um, of particular interest to you, Jason? I mean, is it is it, you know, just if, if there's something really specific that you want to know about and want to find a blog that might might cover that topic, um, what is your method for finding that? Do you have one? So method one that doesn't work all too well is doing a Google search for it. Uh, surprisingly, you can find a lot of, of lists of blogs related to whatever topic you're going to search for. But the one that, that does prove more beneficial is um, asking people what blogs they read. Uh, that's what has, has gotten me a lot of the resources that, that I look at a lot. Um, you know, find that person who's interested in genealogy, say, and ask them if they read any genealogy blogs and see if they'll share what they read, or the person that's interested in technology and see if they'll share um, what what they read, or, or cars and so on, because a lot of the times those are the people who are going to give you the, the best information because they've probably spent far more time looking for these blogs than, than you want to allocate to it. Okay, and, and finally, uh, more of a comment than a question, but just um, a comment here that, that finding the time to continue to learn new technology um, is really one of the biggest challenges. And I think you kind of spoke to that, Jason, in, in you know, the fact that you try to carve out in your morning, you know, one of the first things is to go on those sites that help keep you up to date in terms of, you know, how do you devote time to learning new technology. And that seems like one way that you have found to do that. Yeah, certainly. Okay. All right, well, we're a few minutes before three, but um, that looks like all the questions. So, so um, you know, Jason, once again, I want to thank you for the time and, and the content for today's webinar. It certainly gives us a lot of things to be thinking about and looking at. Um, and we, we look forward to having you again in February to talk about technology plans. Um, and for all of you listening and participating, thank you for your questions today. Um, we did record today's webinar, so if you have colleagues um, that couldn't participate or if you want to uh, go back and, and, uh, and hear what Jason had to say again or, or some of the resources he mentioned in descriptions, uh, we'll have that up on the CE Archives page later next week. Uh, so with that, we will we will uh, sign off and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jason.